as you can tell if you look at the edges, it's not been completed, it's just a quilt top. And the owner has chosen to leave it just as a quilt top. Those of you who are, who are into antique quilts probably know that the minute somebody starts working on that quilt, it's no longer an antique, it's a 19 or 2015 quilt. So they have elected to leave it just as it is. Okay, let's start with our first quilt, which is known as a spiderweb quilt. This is probably the newest quilt we have in the collection that we're showing today. But this one always, when I say that, I always feel kind of mm, not quite sure because made in the 60s and is an antique. Well, I was born in the 40s. Guess what that makes me? Kind of hard to reconcile that but this is spider web quilt uh, it was made from scraps as so many quilts were uh, the at the time it was made you could order cutaways what they call cutaways uh, by the pound you from magazine ads and they were that's how the people women got a lot of their scraps to use in the quilt thank you our next quilt is known as a snowball scrappy quilt uh, this one, it states to the late 1940s or early 50s. Um, her mother was a talented sewer and she made a lot of, used a lot of scraps from dresses and so forth. And the backing of this particular quilt is a feed sack, which is very common to use um, to, to back your quilts with. Um, one of the neighbors of the owner said was an old maid and she set up a quilt frame in her living room. And neighbors would gather there and work on quilts. And uh, Martha says that she can remember climbing or crawling under the big tent, as she called it, and playing. And every once in a while, she was tasked to find that runaway spool of thread that had dropped to the floor. Thank you. Our next quilt is a scrappy hexagon quilt. And the owner bought this particular quilt at an auction. So a lot of the quilts that are in this display are that kind of thing so we don't have a whole lot of history on them but based on the fabrics that are used we think this dates back about to the 1930s thank you is barbara with us this time no barbara's not in here let's go around uh, this next quilt um, is a two-tone pink and white and it's a modified nine uh, nine hash uh, we looked very hard trying to find the actual name of it but we could not identify it more specifically than that uh, Barbara said that when she was putting this, uh, taking the pictures to send to me for this, she noticed that there's a mistake in the quilt. And one of the rows has been completely reversed in the center of the quilt from the way it should have been put pieced into it. And she says the thing that makes that so interesting to her is that her mother was a very precise, picky kind of person. And to have missed this kind of an error just came as a big surprise to her. Thank you. She wants to see. Can I see it? Sure. Where does this say? Where is it? Here to here. Is that right? I think so. I think. I think it's this whole here should be different than that square there. Isn't that corner of the state also? Oh, is there another one up there? Yeah. Well, everything else is on the right paint except for that one corner piece right there. Okay, that could be it too. Yeah, exactly. Top I right noticed corner. this here being the same. They might be talking about that. And then this is pink. And what about her hands? I can't see that far over here. <laughs> <laughs> they made mistakes too. Of course, it was on the curve. There you go. As the Amish say, nobody's perfect except God. So if there's a mistake in your quilt, just live with it. All right, we've got a sunbonnet Sioux quilt here that dates back to the 1920s. And this is just a little scrappy, but it's, as the owner says, it's well used and it's faded and become a little dingy. But it was, of course, hand applique and hand quilted. Um, one of the nice touches is the addition of detail to the bonnet. It brings a little bit more life to the quilt itself. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, our next quilt is a Dresden plate, and this particular quilt was pattern was probably one of the most popular patterns in the 1920s and the 1930s, and this quilt does date back to about 1938. Um, 
recognize as a log cabin, exactly, log cabin. This one dates back about to the 1920s, mid-20s, and again, as quilts were during that time, it was strictly utilitarian. I mean, it was made to be used, not necessarily to be just a beautiful ornament. They needed it for keeping warm and so forth. So, um, again, like, uh, like others, it's fading and showing its signs of age, but still a well-loved quilt. Okay, our next quilt is one that came from a collection in Georgia, and it is a grandmother's flower garden. I love it because of the centerpieces are so small as compared to most grandmother flower garden. Uh, and it has a very unique border, you'll see. Instead of the straight border, they took time to do the hexagon border all the way around this particular quilt. Thank you. And then we have, a, in contrast to that, we have the larger version, the one that you more typically see size-wise in, uh, in the grandmother's flower garden. And every one of those hexes has been hand-tied in this particular quilt. This one was purchased at an auction and really know, don't know anything about this one. Okay, our next one. Okay, the next one is known as Follow the Leader. Again, this is an auction purchase. Um, no one, we don't really know what it dates back to, but it uses a turkey red and cheddar colors. Now, turkey red is a term that came not from the country of Turkey, as I had always assumed, but it was actually from the Mediterranean era, uh, area rather, and it was a color that was very sought after by seamstresses, quilt makers, because that particular brand of, or type of red would not fade. Now, they lost me after the first instruction on this one. I have the recipe for making a turkey red dye. First of all, you clean your yarn or cloth by boiling it. Then, you steep it in rancid olive oil or castor oil, soda, and cow or sheep dung. I'm done. That's why I'm out at that point. <laughs> then you fix the color with alum and sumac. Then you dye it in a mixture of matter, and I don't know what that is, ox blood and chalk. Matter. If they hadn't lost me already, I'm gone at that point. Matter is a, a type of food. It's a color. It's a color, okay. And then finally, you wash it to brighten the color. That's how turkey red was made back in the day. What do you say, turkey red? It's called turkey red. And, but the women wanted that. They were willing to pay as much as 10 times more for that than for the home, homemade brand of red because the red would stay red as you wanted it. But like I said, those instructions, I don't think I could have made it. Okay, our next quilt is a nine patch. This one was made in the late 1800s. Uh, by Willie Poe. She was born in 1873 and married a Methodist preacher, so I'm sure she traveled around a lot. Um, at the, she was 81 at the time she died. She lived with um, our, her owner over there, mother-in-law and her children, and died in 1954. Again, this is hand-tied, as you can see in all the corners. Thank you. This is another quilt from the late 1800s made by the same lady, and this is a windmill pattern. Thank you. And we have a third quilt made by the same lady. And this one is a triangular triangle. That was the best description I could find for the pattern on that one. And this one also features, like many of them did, a feed sack backing. Thanks, ladies. What kind of backing? Feed sacks. Okay, this is our uh, next quilt one. is a double Irish chain, and it's with the red and the black, it was machine pieced but hand quilted in the Baptist stitch. And I'm not sure what the Baptist stitch was. 
Okay, kind of like a windshield wiper going. Okay, okay. Uh, the owner, her mother's family, grew up near the Savannah River, and story has it that when she ran out of thread, she pulled a piece of hair out and kept sewing. That's dedication, girls. This is true, they did have long hair. All right, this quilt dates back to uh, about 1880. And this is considered to be a baby quilt. Uh, it's called flying, it's flying geese pattern. It's called the wild goose chase. And um, when it was appraised, the, uh, the appraiser said she felt it was a baby quilt, but she also felt that it was a quilt for a baby who had died because it showed very little wear and tear. And, um, and it was in really good shape at the time. Okay. This quilt is also by, from Martha, and I'm going to let Martha talk about these next two quilts, or this next quilt. This was her family. Um, this quilt belonged to my great-grandmother. She was the mother of the one that did the black and red, and um, I don't think you mentioned the knife edge on that no, black I'm and right red thread, but um, they didn't have any binding on that one. It was just a knife edge, and it's just as straight as it can be. But this quilt was dated pre-Silver War by a few years and everyone looks at it and instantly thinks it's the Rose of Sharon but it's not it's uh, it was appraised in Tennessee and the lady thinks that it is a the the quilt makers own variation of the Rose of Sharon but um, I don't know whether my great-grandmother made this quilt or had help with it. But um, it's quilted with the Baptist stitch also, which is like the windshield wiper, she called. That's what we always grew up calling it. And um, the colors were dyed. It was, the cotton was used from my great-grandfather's field. And during the Civil War, Sherman came through the area. They lived down near the Savannah River. And Sherman came through, and they didn't have a whole lot of values, valuables, but this was valuable to them. And they dug a hole in the ground and buried the quilt so that uh, Sherman wouldn't take it because he was known to just destroy everything inside. The church that the family went to, Sherman used as a hospital for his injured soldiers. And um, they did leave the building intact. But he made a big mark on the front door of the church, and he wanted everybody to remember that Sherman had been there. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> okay, our last quilt is dated about 1850, and this is the pineapple applique as well. It was one of those red and greens, and obviously she didn't use turkey red on this one because it's faded out quite, didn't quite a great deal. Um, but it has, it is the, uh, panel, panel applique pattern. Historians tell us that during the mid-1800s, I'm getting a little tired now, <laughs> applique quilts were almost always stitched from red and green fabrics on a white background. That was the most logical reason, they think, was because the green from the foliage, the green leaves and trees and so forth, and then the red from the flowers. And that was probably their reason for using those colors as much as anything. And that's the end of our show, ladies. Thank you so much.